an autonomous region of China, is as large as seven UKs combined. Welcome to Xinjiang, China's far northwest. In 1949, when the new China was founded, this vast land faced massive challenges. Transportation, mostly camel caravans, horse and donkey carts. School, fewer than one in five kids could go. The rest, well, herding sheep, picking cotton, shelling corn, a life expectancy just 30, well below the world average. So, how does Xinjiang go from this to this? Way back in 1954, China launched the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, which literally built cities out of desert. One of them even snagged a UN award for sustainable urban development. In 1955, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region was established, with regional ethnic autonomy fully implemented across the region. Fast forward to recent decades, tens of thousands of officials and professionals from across China have been sent here to close development gaps one by one. And since 2012, the central government of China has allocated more than 4 trillion yuan in transfer payments to Xinjiang. The Western Development Strategy the Belt and Road Initiative and other efforts have turned Xinjiang from relative isolation into one of China's new gateways to the world. Seven decades on, the camel caravans are still around. Only now, they're for tourists. Even the Takli Makan, the world's second largest shifting desert, is now crossed by highways and encircled by a railway. And to hold back its sand, China has planted a 3,046 km green belt around it. That's roughly the distance from Paris to Moscow. In fact, connectivity has never been this great for Xinjiang. For instance, the region received over 300 million tourists last year, ranking second in China in tourism popularity. Urumqi, the world's most remote city from the sea, enjoys fresh seafood daily. The first China-Europe freight train traveled through Xinjiang in 2011. Today, roughly 45 pass through each day. In Hogos, one can cross into another country just by walking. Locals call it a one-second border. This growing connectivity has also filled an economic boom rarely witnessed in human history. Xinjiang's regional GDP hit over 2 trillion yuan in 2024, a 203-fold increase since 1955, with an average annual growth rate of 8%. In 1950, less than 15% of Xinjiang's population was urban, far below the global average of 30%. Now, over 60% of people call cities home. All this growth isn't just flashy numbers. In fact, over 70% of Xinjiang's annual fiscal spending has gone to the improvement of people's livelihoods. Every child now gets compulsory education. Life expectancy, once 30 years in 1949, has soared to 77 today. And by the end of last year, 2.73 million rural safe housing units had been completed under the Rural Dilapidated House Renovation Program. But not everyone outside China is happy to see Xinjiang's development. We see uh, a genocide. Well, Native Americans would probably be shocked that genocide now means more than tripling the population. These policies, what you're calling cultural genocide. If that were true, it must be the least effective policy ever, because ethnic cultures are still everywhere. On road signs, banknotes, radio. <laughs> In fact, Xinjiang is just like many places around the world, traditional and religious, yet modern and secular at the same time. You could start your day listening to prayers at a mosque, spend the afternoon riding horses with Kazakh herders, and end the evening at a Kyrgyz bonfire festival. Or, in a more modern twist, watch drones pollinate apple orchards in Aksu in the morning, hop into a livestream shopping event at Rumchi's International Grand Bazaar in the afternoon and toast the night on Kashgar Old Town's Bar Street. If you haven't been to Xinjiang yet, come see for yourself because nothing beats seeing it with your own eyes.